Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be to be here right now. Uh, I would just be uh, trying to be uh, brief here. Um, I'll be presenting the initiatives of the Department of Budget and Management on progressive budgeting to address socioeconomic inequalities that resulted from the from the pandemic. So my my presentation here would be only composed of two parts. The first one will be a discussion on the of the investments in human capital development prioritized by the DBM that will help bridge the gap uh, of various socioeconomic inequalities resulting from the pandemic. Uh, here, the main protagonist would be the line agencies because they are the ones who initiated and implemented this, uh, these projects and programs and DBM is just at the background providing the needed uh, financial support as we deem these programs to be really justifiable and urgent. Okay? And for the second part, I'll be talking about the DBM reforms and initiatives undertaken to improve efficiency, transparency, and accountability in public service. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, and then next, still the next one. Okay, so I'll start with the uh, investments in human capital development being a priority of the DBM. So to address socioeconomic inequalities, we continue to support investments in human capital development to accelerate our post-pandemic recovery as we resume economic activity okay, and start rebuilding after more than uh, two years of being in a health crisis. So consistent with the expenditure directions we submitted to Congress last or two weeks ago okay, for the full year, fiscal year 2023, the DBM prioritizes expenditures in education, health, and social protection that will provide long-term effects to address the issues of malnutrition, access to health service, employability, and reduction of poverty. So these interventions will impact the future productivity of Filipinos, which will eventually lead to economic gains. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'll start with the education sector. Okay? So the DBM supports the implementation of student financial programs, which provide uh, free technical and vocational education and training. Uh, you have the tertiary education I think we lost the audio of our okay. asset. How, how about that? I Can I confirm uh, if I'm heard right now? Yes, oh, we can hear you now, sir. But could you please uh, repeat the earlier? Okay, uh, so so here I'll, I'll be talking about the, well, just to point out that the DBM is supportive of the student financial programs, which somehow allows many of our underprivileged uh, students, no? to access free education, vocational and technical training, okay? and also to access uh, student loans no? on, on, uh, while, while, while in school. Okay? And this include students' financial programs of the DepEd, the CHED, and the TESDA. Okay? And then uh, likewise, you have the assistance to individuals in crisis situations, or the, what we call the AICS. Okay? which is aimed to complement the social amelioration programs of the government. Uh, and uh, the DBM has recently released an amount of 2 billion pesos to cover individuals and families in these difficult circumstances, no? which was utilized by the DSWD in collaboration with, uh, with the DepEd and CHED okay? uh, to distribute cash assistance worth 1,000 pesos for elementary students, 2,000 for high school, and 3,000 for senior high school, and 4,000 for college and vocational courses. I think this is something that you've been hearing in the news recently. So here, the money that is uh, that is uh, programmed for this uh, for this line item why it was used efficiently. Oh, well, I think that is uh, that is uh, subject to 
to to debate okay but the idea is to to support okay with uh, the, our students uh, given that classes have just started uh, recently okay uh, next slide uh, in the health services okay so the country's recent experience during the pandemic and the demand of, for health services uh, for uh, during this thing, time of recovery highlighted the need to strengthen our health systems no? through continued investment in health service improvement. Okay? So specifically focusing on the enhancement of primary health care facilities as the entry point of patients with the health system. Okay? And um, also the D DBM ensures the implementation of this public health emergency benefits and allowance for healthcare workers up. So uh, this is the medical assistance to indigent and financially incapacitated patients, okay, which is provided with, uh, which we will be supporting in the, in the coming year. Uh, and this covers the medical assistance to indigent patients seeking consultation, uh, rehabilitation, examination, okay, and uh, for those who are confined in government hospitals. Okay? And then lastly, support is given to ramp up uh, vaccination efforts to pro protect the population from the emergence of more transmissible COVID-19 variants. No? So specifically the uptake of booster shots for the elderly and vulnerable populations to strengthen their immunities to prevent the adverse symptoms of the COVID-19 disease. Okay? I think this is also covered in the in the budget for the next year uh, and uh, I think it's to the tune of 22 billion for this uh, booster shots and uh, uh, just for this vaccination efforts for the coming years. Uh, next slide please. Okay so we all know what this pandemic has done to, to all of us no so especially during the during the hard lockdowns no? where you have restricted movements of people and goods and which resulted to the closing down of many factories. You have supply chains being cut, daily wage workers ending up with no pay and consumers experiencing difficulty in buying food. So, and it's also coupled with the recent uh, thing of this increasing fuel prices no? and the resulting inflation of basic commodities, which really have a big impact on the the way um, um, we access food, no, especially for the vulnerable sector. No? So to address this, the DBM continues to support social protection programs that are responsive to the needs of the country as it adjusts to changes as a result of emergencies and more recently this thing of the rising inflation. So the DBM provides funding for implementation of the Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program or the four piece assistance to the vulnerable sector during the post pandemic. And the four piece is a human development program of the national government that invests in the health and education of poor households. Um, and also I think it's mentioned in the President Sona, this effort of updating the list that is being used for this program, this four piece, which is called the Lista Hanan, or the, this is the registry for the four piece. And uh, he identified that idea of updating and cleaning of the four piece registry as a priority to address targeting uh, inefficiencies of the program. Okay. Um, basically, this is something that uh, we have good things in mind, no? and the government is really providing the, the needed uh, support, the financial support. But somehow at the back of our minds, you have this issue of credibilities no? on, the, on the list no? that we are having right now. So clearly this is something that we have to keep on, on monitoring, especially that it cannot be the same people in that list. No? Uh, there should be a, some sort of a graduation no? from uh, being there because some people, as we grow, as our economy uh, continues to grow, might be removed from, from that poverty uh, uh, group. No? And for some, maybe there, there will be an inclusion of some new, new people. And it has to be really updated. No? And apart from the fact that you, you really need a, a good profiling system 
for to come up with a credible list. Okay? And uh, also, in addition, to support uh, this thing of uh, helping the, the marginalized sector of our economy, is we provided this thing of the targeted cash transfer program. Okay? And the beneficiaries receive cash aid to help cope with the increasing fuel prices and the resulting inflation of basic commodities. So last uh, July, I think the DBM approved an amount of 4.1 billion uh, fund for the implement implementation of this TCT. And this will facilitate the release of the second batch of cash transfers to over 4 million beneficiaries. I personally like this program because uh, it's something that is urgent. Although this, this money was taken from the, this thing of calamity funds. No? So you see here that the government is trying to, to update its kind of definition of what is a calamity or what is really a disaster. Okay? So inflation is indeed something that will solely affect the, the lives of, of everyone. Okay? But it's not affecting uh, the people in the same way. So here comes the government to provide that caution uh, to those people who may be unfairly affected by, by the rising fuel prices. And I think this is something that, that uh, really requires government intervention because uh, it's not something that can be easily addressed using the market forces, right? So, so I think this thing of the cash transfer is uh, very important and very responsive and because of its uh, uh, sense of urgency. Again, this boils down again to, to our list of beneficiaries and that's why we, we, we go back then to that, to that list and then making sure that the, those who are really, uh, so, so those who are supposed to be uh, given this, um, this uh, benefits should be the, the, the rightful ones. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so lastly, the pandemic affected not only the children and the working population, but also the elderly. So hence the social pension for indigent senior citizens provides additional government assistance in the amount of 500 pesos monthly allowance to augment the daily subsistence and other medical needs of indigent senior citizens who are not members of any pension system. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll go now to programs uh, and projects that are more directly, uh, where, where DBM is more directly involved. No? So here, uh, I'll be presenting the, uh, some initiatives undertaken by DBM to improve efficiency, transparency, and accountability in public service delivery. So to ensure effective uh, implementation of programs uh, aimed at addressing socioeconomic gaps okay, and accelerating economic recovery. So we have this, uh, some public financial management reforms that are being pursued by the government. No? So driven by the, key, the three key strategies, no? namely the policy framework, re-engineering process and optimizing e-governance. Okay? So here I indicated three major uh, policies that we are trying to push, or at least some uh, one of them I've already started uh, 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 doing. So we have the cash budgeting system, the integrated financial management system, and uh, well, the push for this budget modernization bill. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me begin by uh, discussing with you the cash budgeting system, okay, or we call it CBS, okay, as one of the government's trusts identified by the chief executive during his first SONA. Okay. So this, this system, in a way, signaled the shift from obligation-based budget system to cash budgeting system, stating that okay, it aims to strengthen the fiscal discipline in the allocation and use of budget resources to ensure that every peso budgeted by the government would lead to the actual delivery of programs and projects and benefits all sectors, especially the poor and marginalized. So I think it would be easier to, to, to provide you with more details of this one by comparing the cash budgeting system and the, the uh, obligation-based system um, in the next slide. 
Okay, so here you see uh, in the rightmost column, the obligation-based budgeting system. So this in the olden times, this is what we've been doing. Okay, Now, since 2019, we started using the cash, cash budgeting system. So you see in the first column, you have the three phases. Whenever you, when you do that implementation of any projects, you have the obligation phase, implementation, and the payment and the payment. So in the in the previous system, okay, so you you can actually contract projects until the end of two fiscal years. So the tendency is for agencies to submit programs to be included in the budget uh, at the end of the first fiscal year. So without really intending to implement it within 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 the within that year within the first year because it's not any more possible. So this will be carried over to the next year. So you have a very bright or very good numbers in the first year saying ah, we have many programs, but none of them really are implemented because these are carried over in the next uh, fiscal year. Now in the next fiscal year, there's a possibility even of. Uh, procrastinating or whatever you can you can delay the implementation and uh, to the to the succeeding years so that has been the the thing that's been happening in the past no but with the current cash budgeting system with which only allows agencies to obligate and implement their programs and projects within the year so somehow they are in a way uh, compelled to only sub, uh, uh, su submit projects and programs that are implementation ready, meaning those that can only be finished within the, the within a, uh, the first fiscal year, and then you just ask again next year or something like that. No, so it's something that makes it. Uh, I mean, because the problem is the utility utilization rates of the agencies, so they tend uh, most of the government agencies, especially the DPWH would normally have a very low utilization rates because of the uh, not able to finish all the projects in time. Okay, And even though these projects are really priority projects, okay? but the, the thing there is uh, uh, you have difficulty in fulfilling uh, what you have promised, so to say. So in other words, that idea of uh, you, you have, the, as they say, you know, the, uh, the path to hell is paved with with good intentions, no? we have all. We all want good things, no? We program things, we budget even uh, these things, but at the end of the day, when it comes to the implementation, so you have a very, very low um, uh, metric for for that thing, which is actually the most important part. Okay, that these things are really completed. Okay, so in the next slide, please. You see here also in the, the graph, okay, uh, we started the cash-based system in 2019. Just to, uh, just want to lead your attention here. In 2017, you can see that the many government agencies accepted many projects or, uh, or submitted many projects to the, to the DBM and obligated 94.1%. Right? But since there are so many things there, so so much on the so much food on the plate, so they could only consume or uh, disperse this thing of sixty five point eight percent. So there's that big gap okay, be between what was programmed and what was actually implemented. So in twenty nineteen, this gap between the blue and the red line is uh, diminished. Okay, so uh, when we use the this thing of cash-based approach, okay? So from 91, 91.3% obligation, obligation rate, uh, and then comparing it to this disbursement rate of 78.7%, okay? Okay, next slide, please. So in line with the administration's campaign uh, towards uh, optimizing digital governance and increasing bureaucratic efficiency, the establishment of an integrated financial management information system will allow real-time online accounting, monitoring, and control of obligations and disbursements, and directly link this to cash management for more effective financial control and accountability. This will facilitate the generation and monitoring of vital information on all aspects of government 
financial transactions which are key for the government to make informed decisions. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll skip that one. I think in the interest of time, it's just uh, uh, budget uh, modernization bill covers this thing of cash-based uh, cash base approach and also this thing of uh, digitalization uh, efforts. Okay, so in addition to the previous reforms presented, uh, here are further measures that this administration will be undertaking to ensure efficiency, transparency, and accountability in public service. So consistent with the ease of doing business and efficient government service delivery act of 2018. So the use of digital payments in government collections will promote efficient delivery of government services, expedite transactions and boost revenue and reduce the risk of graft and corruption. So last May 12, 2022, so there was an executive order that was signed mandating all departments agencies and instrumentalities of the government, including state use okay, uh, and GOCCs to adapt digital payments for their respective uh, disbursements and collections. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then here we have the so-called right sizing program or its complete name is National Government Right Sizing Program. Okay. So this in line with the president's directive to streamline the bureaucracy and strengthen the interoperability among government agencies in order to provide an easier, simpler and safer and more secured public services to the Filipinos. So this program is a priority. Okay? Um, and uh, well, I think this is not about mass layoff. Okay? So it's different from downsizing. So right sizing is just trying to find that right size of government and, uh, and in the process, it tries to assess okay, those uh, uh, things that we can still streamline and even to the point of abolishing some government offices or bureaus uh, in order to eliminate government functions that are redundant or overlapping. Okay? In this way, we'll be saving a lot of, uh, a lot of money okay? and, and lessening the bureau bureaucracy also the the part of this thing of doing uh doing uh the ease of business so it's not it's not downsizing because um it also covers uh the creation of new functions new positions okay, as deemed uh important by the respective agencies so in some uh, government agencies they're even promoting this idea of coming up with some research arm uh, that will actually complement uh, their way of doing analysis. Okay? And I think that's something very important. And in some agencies, they're even doing some kind of retooling program, given the fact that in the advent of digitalization, so some, some functions may be displaced. Okay? And in the process, you have to put them somewhere, okay? And you have to train and to, to also compensate them. So there is in fact a, a budget for that, something like, something like 30 billion for the creation of new offices. But at the same time, there's also something like 50 billion that is budgeted for uh, payments of this thing of separation, separation, uh, uh, payments for those people who may be displaced. Okay? But it's not just about uh, reduction of uh, employees, okay, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Okay? And then uh, next slide, this will be my last slide, I think. Okay? So amid all these uh, plans for human capital development and plans to improve public service delivery, we also importantly take note that the DBM will lead the implementation of the Green Public Procurement or the GPP Roadmap through the government procurement uh, policy board. So this supports the administration's objective of sustaining the management and use of natural resources by 2030, integrating green and eco-friendly choices in terms of public procurement. So at the moment, the drafting of the GPP manual, which will serve as a guide in future public procurement is already in the works. No? So with all these plans for the coming years, we can be assured uh, of a proactive and responsive uh, government able to deliver 
what it has promised to do. Okay? Um, I think that's that's my last slide. So thank you very much for listening.